You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. On the line, we have Cooper Carraway. He is the president of the South Dakota AFL-CIO, and he is on the line now to talk to us about poultry workers fighting the boss in his state. Cooper, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. I'm very glad to have you. So, uh, fill us in on the situation. There's some there's some poultry plant workers uh, in your state that uh, there there was a big just just talk to us about what they've been dealing with. Uh, you know, what have they been dealing with the last year? All right. So this is a this is a, actually a port uh, processing plant uh, okay. in uh, in Sioux Falls uh, under Smithfield Foods. Um, so over the last year. Uh, you know, the, the Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls uh, uh, for a long time when the pandemic started was actually the number one hot spot for the coronavirus uh, in the country. And if you looked at the list of the hot spots, every other uh, facility on the list were prisons uh, and you had like one um, aircraft carrier out in the middle of the ocean. But Everything else was prison, uh, but number one on the list was the Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls. It was the only workplace on the list, all right? Um, and it, this is because management really did not take the coronavirus seriously. They were taking their cues from Donald Trump. They were taking their cues from Governor Christy Noem, uh, and they were not taking the virus seriously. Months before the pandemic even hit Sioux Falls, the workforce, uh, the workers there at the plant, uh, sounded the alarm. They said that they, they said to management that uh, you need to take the coronavirus seriously um, because uh, the, the workforce is largely uh, immigrants and refugees. So they were in a unique position. They were getting uh, uh, information from uh, from their home countries about how the coronavirus is affecting uh, their home countries, and they were raising the alarm and saying, "Okay, we need to be proactive. We need to put in these safety measures." And the bosses just closed the door in their face. Uh, fast forward uh, to today, over 1,200 of the workers in that one plant uh, tested positive for the coronavirus, uh, and four of them died uh, just from that. And so, entering into contract negotiations, uh, this is this is national news. All right, this is number one hotspot in the country. This is national news. Uh, how poorly management handled uh, this issue. Uh, so heading into contract negotiations this year, everyone expected that this would be a smooth negotiation, that you know the, these workers had been called by their bosses essential workers and heroes and all these other things. Uh, and so they, they came in asking for modest pay increases uh, and whatnot. And management came back with, uh, with proposals that not only didn't provide the modest pay increases, uh, but actually is, is t- asking to, uh, for, for the workers to give up uh, several of their breaks uh, and several of the other things that uh, that they already have, um, and uh, the workers, you know, resoundingly um, voted down management's proposal uh, this week uh, ninety by ninety nine percent. That's insane. That's so. So, what are these? What does the pay scale look like for these uh, uh, for for these workers? Yeah, so base pay at the plant is, is seventeen dollars, okay. uh, and for for the work, you know, that's that's yeah. that's underpaid. You know, seventeen dollars is is barely is barely a living wage uh, in uh, in South Dakota um, for for a single person. Um, but a lot of these workers have families, uh, and so you need you definitely need uh, a base pay to be to be higher. Um, just just right across the border in Minnesota. Uh, base pay is uh, $19 at the, J- at the JBS plant. Um, and so the workers were asking, okay, it's, it's you know, 20, 30 minute drive, so uh, it makes sense for J- base pay here to be $19. Uh, and then it can, we can adjust the pay scale. So, you know, you do have folks who've been there, you know, 20 years, you know, whatnot, making $30 an hour or something like that. Uh, but it, it makes sense to adjust the base pay. Um, and uh, the company is, is not interested in those kind of things. And you said that the company's proposal was there was there was no, there weren't any improvements. It was all it was all cuts like across the board to their breaks to their pay everything. 
Yeah, so they're asking for concessions. Um, and, you know, they're, they're asking to eliminate one of the 15-minute breaks. The workers are guaranteed two 15-minute breaks in addition to their lunch. Uh, and uh, management wants to cut that 15-minute break. Uh, if you ask management, they would probably tell you that um, that they uh, want they, they, they want to increase the vacation time because they did say they're going to give a couple extra vacation days. But in return, what they're asking for is the elimination of unpaid leave. So like I said, a lot of these workers are, are, are refugees, um, and so they use, uh, a lot of times they have to use their unpaid leave um, because they need to go back uh, to, uh, to Africa, you know, they need to go back to Asia and spend time with their families or, or see their families if there's a health issue or something like that, and they use their unpaid leave when they do that because they don't know when they'll be able to get back. Um, but, but the company is not paying them, uh, and so this is a system that's worked out well uh, up to this point. Um, and so, so the company would say, well, we're asking for, you know, we're, we're offering us some more vacation days, but in exchange for that, asking for these workers not to be able to go back to their home countries, uh, and, and I see that as a concession. That's, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely a concession. You know, these like these these workers to, to go back and visit their families in their home countries. I mean, they're not even, you know, they're not even asking for pay. It's just let me come back to my job when I when I'm able to get back. That doesn't sound like that's not that's not a big ask. It seems to me, and uh, you know, I mean, that's just the. The inhumanity of, of these bosses um, after has really been exposed in the pandemic. It, se- it seems to me, um, and, and through a lot of these contract negotiations that are being more publicized as as worker struggles are, are getting more uh, more coverage. I think in, in the in the media, but I mean we can look and, and we're going to be talking to Hayden Wright, one of the miners' wives, here in just a second about some of the violence that they've been seeing on the picket lines from scabs and bosses. But um, I mean. From the negotiation side down there, it's been insane. You know, the um, the chief negotiator for the uh, for the company has said that she reckons the miners down there get paid too much, and they were asking for concessions as well. Um, eventually, like after they went on strike, they gave them some meager or they offered some meager ben- uh, improvements, but it wouldn't have even been. Uh, it was a five year contract, and it wouldn't have even been enough to keep up with inflation over the five years, you know, much less get them back what they lost in 2016. And, and you know, as we're... You know, as we're coming out of this pandemic, as we are coming out of this this time where the miners and those um, uh, pork processing plant employees sacrificed so much for this country, you know, you said that the company was using this language of essential workers and heroes and things like that, and and of course companies across the board have done that, and and now you know, I mean, like it it. it <sighs> It's insane that they are <laughs> that they have the audacity after a year like this and the sacrifices that workers have made to ask for more instead of even offering meager gains. They're asking for more sacrifices from the workers. Yeah, you're right, and you know it just shows that bosses all over the country, um, uh, you know, have have the same uh, line of thought. Uh, and that is, you know, in in, uh, in Alabama, you know, the coal bosses, they say that they think that the workers are just part of the mine. And up here, uh, they say that the workers, they're just part of the plant. You know, they're just an extension of the machinery of the plant. Uh, they're not uh, in any way human, and, and they don't believe they deserve the rights that, uh, that uh, men and women and, and humans deserve. Um, and you know that's 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 just the way they think, and that's being exposed throughout the pandemic. Um, that that you know, the workers are just extensions uh, of of the machinery that, that they work on. Hey Cooper, this is Adam. I, I really like what you just said there. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of a phrase that we hear: human capital. Uh, and there's lots of that kind of talk that really dehumanizes people. And and like you said, just. Uh, conflates these workers as if they are just another machine in the plant. Uh, but something you mentioned in the intro about there were four people who died in this plant, over 1,200 cases of COVID in the plant. 
and management is actually seeking take backs in this contract. Just, I, I know you can't share everything, of course, but to the extent that you can, what is man, what is management's rationale for actually trying to claw back uh, important benefits in this contract after such a year? I think uh, I think management probably is is uh, thinking that they're the victim. Um, they're thinking that it's not the workers that are the victim because the workers are just part of the plant. So how can the plant be the victim? Management's thinking they're the victim. They're the ones who had to shut the plant down uh, several times. They're the ones that had to have the CDC come in and, and have an investigation, even though management didn't even cooperate with the investigation in a good faith way. Uh, they're the ones who had to lose profit. Uh, and things like that. So management probably came to the table feeling like they're the victim. Yep, that's um, right, Cooper. We're going to pick that up and, on the other side. Uh, Stay tuned. With David Story and Jacob Morrison. Welcome back to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison, here with my co-host and fellow agitator, Adam Keller. We are talking to Cooper Carraway. He is the president of the South Dakota AFL-CIO about pork uh, processing plant employees, some of their struggles that they've been going through over the pandemic. And uh, the question that we accidentally threw him up into the into the break against, he was answering was, um, you know, what the, the the boss was asking for concessions in this contract instead of even meager gains for the workers after a year of sacrifice for their company and for their country. Uh, they asked for Concessions. They asked for more from the workers, more sacrifices from the workers. What was and, and you were telling us what their nas- rationale was, and it was that 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 they were the victim. Was, was there anything else that you wanted to add to that? No, that's right, uh, and it and it falls into that you know line of thought that the workers are just part of the plant, part of the machinery, uh, and so they don't have feelings. Uh, so management, from their perspective, uh, uh, sees themselves as the victim because they lost profits. They had to uh, pretend to uh, uh, participate in a CDC investigation. Uh, you know, they had to change up the way they did things. Uh, they lost, you know, uh, uh, things in their budget that they had projected years before and, and things like that. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the workers was part of the plan, so they're not the victims. Management came uh, to the negotiation table with a victim mentality. Right, right. And that's just, I mean, it's it's insane. So they, so uh, the workers voted it down. What was the vote uh, against the contract that was offered? Uh, 99% to 1%. 99% of the workers voted no on the proposed contract. So what is the, and, and so there's, there's an implicit strike threat there. I mean, how much, you know, uh, like Adam said, you know, I, I don't know how much that y'all are going to be able to divulge at this point, but what was, what does the plan look like for these workers going forward to be able to win, you know, dignity and respect and fair wages and working conditions at this job? Yeah, so now uh, I imagine they're going to be head, heading back to the table next week, um, and uh, they'll probably be taking the strike authorization for, uh, around that time as well. Okay, and 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 this is something that that I'm I'm interested in as as somebody who who is active in. Um, you know, in our federation, uh, the the state federation, and, and our local labor council. What uh, it, you know, I mean, you're here, uh, uh, and and you talk to some of the local news about this about this struggle for one of the local unions in your federation. What are what else are the what what else is the South Dakota Labor Federation, the the Sioux Falls Labor Council like? How are unions in the area, or is there a way at this point that they they're able to come together and support these um, these uh, uh, meat processing workers during these negotiations? Yeah, so it's the Federation's role to, uh, uh, you know, gather all the unions, all the worker organizations, and, and to your best ability, you know, the, the working class as a whole, uh, and build uh, solidarity for workers when they're going through something like this. Um, and so, you know, that's that's what I'm out here doing. That's what I'm doing with YouTube. That's what I'm doing with, you know, other media I've been talking to. i got some other uh, shows lined up in the next couple of days. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm out here trying to build solidarity uh, amongst the working class as a whole uh, to support these workers 
Uh, and I, you know, obviously, as soon as there's a ticket line, you know, I'll be working to make sure that all the unions um, in the state or in the area that can are sending folks uh, down, sending supplies, uh, and I'll be uh, uh, I'll be right there uh, on the ticket line the entire time. Yeah, I, I, w- I want to thank you for you know sharing this struggle with us here in Alabama. Turn your mic up, Adam. I can't can't hardly sure. hear you. Can you hear me, Cooper? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I just want to thank you for sharing this struggle with us over here in Alabama. Um, You know, I think the pandemic, as Jacob mentioned, it really exposed a lot. And one of the things that really, you know, hit home for me was the amount of work that comes into actually maintaining our food supply. And, Mm -hmm. you know, these workers are some of the most vulnerable to really dangerous working conditions. And I think that You know, this pandemic, if there's anything good that can come out of it, I hope it's that more folks are aware of how our struggles are all connected. Uh, And what happens with these pork processing workers impacts our food chain. It impacts the wages in your region. Um, And I think that was a great point that just 30 minutes away, you have folks doing basically the same work for two dollars an hour more. So, you know, I appreciate all that you're doing, and we want to send our love and solidarity out to those workers in South Dakota because we know their their struggle is very important, and it's connected to ours as well. Yeah, it is. And, and likewise, you know, just, just like I said earlier, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that, you know, the struggles up here, the, the folks that work in these plants, the folks who work around South Dakota, we understand that uh, our lot is tied in, our, our prosperity is tied in with making sure that the miners uh, in Alabama are victorious. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we believe that with, with, with all of our hearts, and we understand that, and we know you guys feel the same way. Uh, and if, if the working class can maintain that, uh, those ties and that bond uh, across the country and across the world, uh, then all of us will be victorious one day. Amen. Right. Amen. Yeah, I mean that's that that's exactly right. Uh, the, the, and and that was one of the themes of that of that long live stream that we had wh- whenever we would talk to the miners is 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 how how interconnected that community is and 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 then brought broadly across the country. You know, I mean every time that workers lose, that gives another company one more example where they can point to to their worker where their workers are fighting for good wages and working conditions they can point to this loss over here even if it's halfway across the country and say look do you think you're better than these workers look what they accepted and on the contrary every time that workers win even if it's across the country Workers can point to it and say, look, boss man, these workers are being paid a fair wage. Their company isn't going bankrupt. Their employer still makes a good bit of money. Why can't we have what they have? We know that it can be done so we can do it. Every win for workers anywhere is a win for workers everywhere. And and in the same way that a loss for workers anywhere is a loss for workers everywhere. I mean, because exactly like you said, brother, um, all of our struggles are interconnected in, in so many ways. In the in the interpersonal way, as in we're all people, uh, children of God, and I want to see you prosper and do well. But also in the in the material sense that when there is more money flowing into my pocket instead of some New York hedge fund, I'm going to spend more money in my local community and the local retailer, the local grocery store, the local restaurant is going to be able to prosper more. Then they're going to be able to pay their workers more. They're going to be able to expand. They're gonna, I mean, it's just there are so many ways that workers winning is going to be able to help other workers win. And and so I'm you know that's something that we want to make sure that we hit home and I'm so glad that you said that. Yeah, I'm with you, brother. As, as, as the greed and exploitation of the bosses flows freely across all state borders and international borders, so too must the solidarity of workers flow freely across all state borders and international borders. That's right. And this is this being a, a 
heavily refugee workforce that you're discussing here, this makes it an immigrant justice issue and a mm-hmm. racial justice issue uh, because we all know that bosses prey upon those sorts of uh, divisions and vulnerabilities to exploit workers uh, coming from those backgrounds. So we really, um, you know, we hope to see some some victory, some good news. Hopefully you can call us very soon with some great news coming out of South Dakota for these folks. I look forward to it, brother. All right, yeah. Uh, Cooper, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you wanted to leave us with? All power to the working class. If you want to see what we're up to throughout the week, get our snide quips about the news of the day, then you should follow us on social media. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Valley Labor Report. We're on Twitter at Labor Reporters. I'm on Twitter at Jacob M underscore A L. And uh, if you miss part of the show and want to go back and watch it later, you can search YouTube for the Valley Labor Report and subscribe to our channel. You can go back and watch the full show there. And I promise this weekend I'm going to clip segments and you're going to start seeing them on the YouTube channel again next week. I've just been, we have just been so caught up uh, and so busy with other stuff. I haven't been able to clip the past, like, gosh, almost a month of shows I haven't clipped yet. So, uh, got to get that done. But, you know, this is a two man show and you don't have to pay for it. We appreciate it if you do, but you don't have to pay for it. So, you know, in some ways you get what you pay for. But uh, <laughs> we also upload the program on more than 11 different podcasting apps we're behind on that as well going to be working on that i'm we're going to try to get caught up this weekend uh but to see if we are on your listening platform of choice you can go to the valley labor report dot transistor dot fm slash subscribe we've got a website where you can buy our hats and our stickers the valley labor report dot org we've still got probably about 30 hats or so left not uh, you know we're we're getting getting down getting down a little bit uh, on the supply. We bought a hundred and we've sold a sold a good bit of them. Uh, and I've got probably about ten ten hat orders that I need to mail out this week. Again, I'm, we're gonna gonna have a Valley Labor Report uh, uh, work weekend <laughs> this weekend. I think that's what I'm gonna be doing. Uh, if you don't want a hat though but you still want to support us, the best way to do that is throwing us a couple dollars a month on patreon.com slash the Valley Labor Report. 